Hi, everyone. Uh, Mike Napoleon here with Super Speed Golf. Thanks for uh, joining us for another Super Speed webinar. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit different than what you're used to hearing from us. Uh, we have a very special guest here today, uh, Mr. Ian Frazier. Uh, Ian's a Super Speed ambassador and probably, I don't know, one of the preeminent minds on club fitting in the world. So going to be a really fun time talking about, I would say, in under talked about topic when it comes to the world of speed training how it can affect everything that's going on with the clubs in the bag and everything else and what you might be able to do to kind of optimize that out for yourself so uh, i've also got my good friend tyler stanford here so he's going to be here for all of our sciencey biomechanics questions um just a couple little points of interest as we get going here um, we're not going to be showing a big slide presentation this time, so we're just going to get into a few topics. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A panel uh, here on your, your Zoom client. Um, we're going to go through a number of different things. Just type those in, and Kyle Shea is going to be sitting in the background answering some of those questions, and then we'll answer some of those live as well. So I would say without further ado, um, you know, welcome, Ian. Thanks for hopping on with us. Thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate you guys having me on. It's We've had some fun building a, a little series that we had on our channel uh, with regards to building speed. Um, yeah, I've been a, a fan of the of the products for a long, long time, I, you know, and it was it was a real honor to come on as an ambassador. So, yeah, it, it's uh, you said it, it's an under sort of discussed topic, how the impact of if more speed impacts uh the the equipment we have in our bag so you know obviously we've got some great topics to talk about but i'm equally as excited to uh, get into some of the questions that, that the people have live yeah well i mean as a golf coach you know i've always felt like equipment fitting is just an essential part of the overall equation you know what we look at at super speed when we talk about ways to gain speed you know we talk about physical characteristics and you know the way a person's body works and that being a big asset or liability when it comes to creating more speed we look at mechanics of the golf swing um you know how that person's using the ground how they sequence how they're delivering the club to the ball we look at all the neurological components that we do with our overspeed training programs and those aspects you know the fourth big category that we look at is what we've always called impact physics. And really that's just put categorically, you know, how the club head and the ball are interacting and how we can either do that very efficiently or how we can do that inefficiently. And I really think as a coach, that's where the expert club fitter can come in, um, you know, and really help a player optimize those different characteristics. So, you know, before we get into a lot of the details, you know, I would just like to talk a little bit about, you know, what is the process like? Like for those people out there that haven't really been through a club fitting process, I mean, what are we really talking about when we talk about going to get fit for golf clubs? We're talking about matching up the, the 14 clubs in the bag to the player's specific game. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't just mean optimizing it relative to the best launch monitor numbers that we can get. We live in this launch monitor era of, we know what sort of perfect may look like from a launch and spin perspective, but it doesn't always, it, it's not always what the, the sort of client wants is to flight it through a window that we would deem optimal. There's times when we have to be more concerned about being functional than optimal. Um, so it, it's just, it's truly just mapping 14 clubs that will allow that player to make the best of the skill set that they have and creating a relationship so that further down the line, we can continue to revise these 14 clubs as the game evolves. As humans, we are we are truly never, we're never the same for long periods of time. We we change, we go through periods of trying to do different things with our game. We we may be through a speed training phase. We may be in the spring where the, the weather conditions may be a little unpredictable and then we get to the summer and it, and it calms down a little bit and we, we may want to change our launch conditions. That is the role of the fitter is to create that relationship where you're a trusted advisor for the 14 clubs in your client's bag. I've always looked at golf coaches with envy because the, the, the client will always turn to the golf coach and go, what do you think? 
and then they turn to the club fits and go, well, you're trying to sell me something. I'm wary of you, but I trust that guy, right? So I, I've always tried to build a relationship first and foremost with the client and then build upon sort of our, our sort of trust with one another uh, from there. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, you know, from the coaching side, I think that the equipment fitter just needs to be part of the team. I think yes. sometimes the equipment fitter can be too much of a one-off thing where you go off and get club fit and they don't necessarily have all the information they need to do their job right. So, you know, I think on our end, we always recommend, you know, kind of that process of developmental club fitting where the fitting becomes a part of the overall program that's done at the right time, that's done, you know, for the right reasons. Because I, yeah. I do think that there's that time where, you know, somebody – you know, th there's different ways to fit clubs, right? Like somebody slicing the ball, I guarantee you could take somebody that's slicing the ball and put equipment in their hands that's going to make that less. Agreed? 1,000%. You know, and, and I think I've always said to our guys and in, in new fitters who join our company, you can't just look through a club fitter's lens being a club fitter. You actually have to see the side of things from, uh, and it doesn't mean that you have to understand every part of the golf swing and the anatomy and the biomechanics. You don't, you don't need to be as thorough as, uh, you know, specialists like yourself and Tyler are in that department, but you have to understand when the club is the solution or really your best advice is, listen, we're going to have to get together at a further date. You need to put a little time into your swing. You need to build upon the foundation that you've got right now and, and let's come back and, and kind of put these clubs together at the right time. That's, again, I keep going on about this, this trust word, but it is the mm -hmm. most important thing because if we're going to have a long-term relationship with someone and we're going to create lifetime value with that client, there can't be anything but trust in that relationship. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, when we're dealing with our, our tour level players, I mean, again, the equipment is such a critical part of the overall process. So as much as you can, when you are going to go get a club fitting, make sure that you have all the information, make sure you bring in what you're working on or where you are in a speed program. And you know, that kind of gets us to one of the first big questions that we always get at super speed that I want to, I want to bring up to you. And that's that like, inside of our training program. So inside of our cycles where we have those primary training phases and the maintenance phases, I mean, for you, I mean, when, when would you say the best time, once somebody has started doing a speed training program, when's the best time for them to go get that bag assessed, get all those different clubs and maybe go through a gapping or check out if there are any needs? I kind of look at a speed so a speed training phase, a bit like I would look at a series of lessons for, for a client. They're going through change and, and they're going to experience new things with that change. They're, they're going to experience sort of dynamic reaction through their, their movement pattern that maybe never experienced before. That is going to sort of move down the, the, the chain through the golf club and is going to produce completely different dynamics. So, I don't love to be making wholesale changes to someone's equipment when they're in the middle of that change. I love for things to have kind of leveled out a little bit. Maybe they've been through a, a sort of maybe 12 to 16 weeks of speed training and they really feel like they've made that big, big gain. And they're going to start looking at a, a prolonged maintenance phase for, for a period of time. We're going to want to get together at that point and assess things. Um, and again, be straight up with the fitter. And when you go in there and say, listen, I've, I've made some pretty wholesale changes. You know, my driver swing speed used to be 90 and, and now I'm at 98 or 100. I feel like I'm maybe in a different window right now with my equipment. I'll be, I'll be as excited for that client as they are for themselves. So mm -hmm. I think once things sort of level out, Mike, I, I, I like it at that point because there's one thing we crave as club fitters and that is consistent, a consistent strike on the face. I actually don't really care whether your face is a bit open, a bit closed, but if every time the face and the strike are contradicting one another, right? So we may have an out to in path, we may have an open face, but we have a toe strike. And the toe strike is the only thing holding that ball flight together by a thread. Mm -hmm. And the minute that, that strike goes to the heel, we've got the dreaded high spinner, ball speed loss, 
we you know we we kind of have the cut out to the right, all those sorts of dreaded things. We we can't really override that, and we neither should we try to really override mm-hmm. that as club fitters. That's that's as a period where you step back and say, you know, this this is maybe a little bit too severe to build a golf club for you around those characteristics. If it's something you've had all your life, and the likelihood of you changing it is is a little bit more minimal. Yeah, let let's see what we can do. Let's look at upright golf clubs. Sure. Let's look at weight in the heel. Maybe look at the length of the golf club. There's lots of different things that we can do. So uh, I like once things have calmed down through a, a training phase, then we'll start to look at what equipment can sort of enhance the work that you've put in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Tyler, you've done a lot of research on you know when and how long it takes for like an initial speed training program to kind of get to that point of stability. Yeah, I mean, what have you seen in some of the studies that you've done on that? Yeah, and I like kind of what Ian's saying, how important that maintenance is. And, and that's kind of why we designed the protocols the way we did, which is let's get 10 weeks of primary training. That's a time where we know we can start getting some permanence in these speed gains that Ian's talked about. So if we can get someone through 10 weeks and then get them into this good, solid maintenance phase where they've been doing that two, three weeks, that puts them right at a time period where while we'd expect for them to incrementally still gain a little bit, the bulk of their speed gains have, have been had in those first 10, 12 weeks. And, and that then becomes probably at least where I would think it'd be a great time to fit as you insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I think whenever we can get to a point where things are more stable, that's a really good time to test it. The only, the only other thing I would add to it is that, and this may be, you, you guys will probably yell at me. I was a mean golf. Coach, <laughs> still am like, we actually used to use kind of the equipment in ways to promote different changes in the swing. That's something I'd love to yeah. hear some of the, what, what you've done too on, on that, Ian. But I mean, we used to build what we called torture clubs. So like, yep. I mean, if I had somebody that was seven, eight degrees outside to in and hit the banana ball their whole life, like I'm making them a seven iron that's an inch and a half short, that's three, four degrees flat and saying, go to town. And I mean, because they're not going to be able to hit the ball with that if if unless they make an adjustment. But we used to do things like that all the time. I'm kind of curious where where you fall in on some of those type of practices with changing equipment for specific purposes of making a change in the way the players swing. I'm right with you, Mike. I have done that for a long, long time. And all you know, I was just thinking, you know, we are in control of the session, and in that first 15 minutes of the session, I really want to create the the sort of right path for this to go in the right direction. So if I see a certain delivery characteristic, whether it's hitting down on the driver a little bit, and I go, okay, well, th- this isn't going to be functional. I, you know, if I give you a little bit more loft, we're just going to widen that spin loft window, and all of a sudden we're creating less energy, we're creating more spin. And, and I'll be a bit mean like you. I'll pull the eight degree out, and, and I'll say to them for 10, 15 minutes, listen, you're going to have to hit this higher. If we're going to get anything out of this, you're going to have to figure this out. You know, mm-hmm. let's work in ball position a little bit. Let's get your, uh, you know, your setup, get this some some more tilt away from the target. And, and we'll work in that together. And we'll just use yep. the launch monitor data in front of us just to help us shape the swing. And then you hand them the club. And it's that wow factor when they hit that right club with the right delivery that the light bulb comes on and they go, wow, if I have the right A and the right B, we create mm-hmm. the right result. That's actually one of my favorite drills for actually the opposite of what you were just brought up there for those players that kind of tend to have too much downward attack angle and too high of dynamic loft. So, yeah. you know, a little early release, a little kind of flip going on with driver. We used to build... 12, 12 and a half, 13 degree drivers for them and tell them we wanted dynamic loft as low as possible with still hitting up mm-hmm. on it. Right. Um, I guarantee you can take a 13 degree driver, end up with about, you know, 12, 13 degrees of dynamic loft at max and about a three degree upward attack angle. Things are going going to go well for the driver. No doubt. Cool. Well, that's a lot of fun. So why don't we get, why don't we get into the weeds here a little bit on some of the specifics uh, that you see change as far as some of the data that you would tend to see change after a player has gone through a speed training regimen. So, you know, let's say we have that player that started around 90, 92 miles an hour. And now, you know, 10, 12 weeks later is, you know, pretty consistently in that 98 to 101 range with, with driver, you know, let's say that percentage change has 
kind of gone up through the bag. You know, what are some of the other things that you find to change along with that speed? Well, I think people maybe don't quite realize, Mike, is that everything gets somewhat exaggerated the faster you get. The, the peak height will go up. The spin rate will go up. You know, we're, we're going to create more velocity. And, and all these things that are changing dynamically, they can make the ball flight look very foreign to the, to the player. So at, at first, you know, they, they can be a little bit sort of, you know, taken aback by, by the new changes. And, you know, even, even the clubs that they have themselves at 92 miles an hour, they're now at 98. Well, we start to see the shaft work in sort of lead deflection and we can see that dynamic loft really change and, and as we offend that shaft in a more violent fashion, we really are starting to, I mean, let's let's get to the weeds a little bit, right? So we're talking about mm -hmm. centers of gravity, right? So the shaft has a center of gravity. The head has a center of gravity. The head is the dominant mass, weighs more than the shaft. It is less, it, it, the shaft is more uh, flexible. The head is more rigid. So in order for the, the center of gravity in this to meet the center of gravity of that, we have to have more lead deflection, right? And the more force that we put on it, the more the shaft is going to be allowed to deflect. Well, that's creating dynamic loft. That's creating less uh, sort of energy into the golf ball. And all those things are, are losing speed and distance relative to our potential. So that's when the club fitting really starts to matter. We have to then get into the right shaft, maybe a center of gravity a little bit further forward so that we're not creating as much lead deflection. The, the fitters who understand the, the, the club and its 3D sort of movement, dynamic movement, will really understand how to create those, you know, less uh, sort of deflection. And, and that's just in lead. We also have it in this fashion. So we create a little bit more downward droop. Mm -hmm. That changes the dynamic lie angle. Dynamic lie angle is one of our biggest strengths to create strike change within the head. Like we said earlier, if we have the strike in the wrong spot and the strike doesn't complement the face-to-path relationship, then it's, it's it can be a real challenge trying to get a stable ball flight. I can move that strike around the head by changing the dynamic lie angle, by changing how effectively long that golf club is. So you know, there's there's a lot of things that at play when you're dynamically creating more more energy. Yeah, no, I mean, I I completely agree. I feel like as golf coaches, we deal with a lot of variables, but there's just as many variables when it comes to the different you know potential equipment that that player is going to use. I mean, on a simple level, you know, obviously as somebody swinging the club faster, you know, they have the potential they're putting more force down through the golf club. But the way they put that force in, we we tend to see, you know, Tyler, from a just biomechanic standpoint of the way the body's moving, we tend to see more aggressive transitions. We start to see the lower body lead a little bit more in the swing. We tend to see some of those ground forces happen earlier in the swing, which can certainly cause, you know, some more like downswing loading or lag to happen in the swing. Like, Ian, I, I think all of those maybe just as much of an have just as much of effect on some of those variables you're looking at there as just the raw speed. Would you agree? I, I would agree completely. And and I actually think we're talking about what phase are we in right now? I mean, we're probably in, in club fitting phase 3.0 right now. Right. If if we think of think of how club fitting was, you used to go and see your pro, you get a recommendation, static measurements off you go. Um we are, we are now in a launch monitor phase. We we are sort of governed by the launch monitors and what do they tell as well? Yeah, that's great telling us what impact looks like. But what you're talking about, Mike, is, is sort of pre-impact. So how do we affect the golf swing, influence the golf swing to create more energy, be more dynamic before that? I actually think that's the next wave we're coming into mm -hmm. in club fitting is how do we play our part as club fitters and influencing the, the delivery before it gets to impact, knowing that can you change that sequence uh, for a little bit for the player if you go with a heavier club? Maybe if you go with a more upright club, you know, all those little subtle, you know, changes that we can make and can we get to those more efficient forces and can we complement the new efficient forces that are being created? Can we do that within the fitting session? I, I think that's a big part of the future of club fitting. 
or at least to to have the information about how that has changed for the player. Because, I mean, Tyler just did a research study, you know, looking at a lot of this data on uh, Qualysys and Thea and 3D motion capture systems that can measure all of these details of how the club is actually being loaded and delivered. And we did that with our different super speed clubs and some other equipment. Uh, We found some really cool stuff, but we generally see that players have a more aggressive transition. Uh, I'd say just to I, you know, make it really, Tyler, you you talk about it. You've got yeah, more detail here. I just, as, as Ian's talking, those are the kind of things that make me excited, right, Ian, the possibility of collecting biomechanical data during a club fitting. Because yeah. when I bring people into my lab and, and give them the super speed clubs of various weights or a driver or a, a club that's a little bit shorter, or a, an iron, things like that, like, motion changes a little bit, right? Force production changes a little bit. And so, you know, we definitely see that as people speed train, you know, force goes to the lead leg earlier, rotational velocities of the trunk improve. Um, but the idea kind of becomes, right, Ian, like are, are there opportunities to take a golfer and based on the club we give them to alter the timings of these kinematic and kinetic sequences, make the golfer more efficient because of the inertial properties of the club and now we're attacking this from multiple angles of, hey, let's get the benefits of speed training and then let's put the right piece of equipment. And now we're getting this beautiful synergy of both things, creating better motion of the body that translates to better motion of the club. And, and I think as biomechanics data gets easier to collect, uh, we're going to see, like you said, maybe club fitting 4.0 coming our way. Definitely. I, I love, you know, we, we certainly hope so. I mean, there, there's a guy in the UK, um, Dave Brailsford is his name. He he was the uh, cycling coach for um for the the sort of Sky team. He was British head of the British cycling team, and he had a phrase of it's the aggregation of marginal gains. So when we go into any one thing, I mean, looking for ten or fifteen percent of improvement is highly unlikely and, and probably unrealistic. But we can accumulate eight or nine one percents from various places. And like you said at the start, Mike, about being part of a team where we, we are taking, uh, you know, the, the approach on, and from a biomechanical standpoint, working with someone who can help us with the movement patterns, working with a coach or working with a club fits or working with a fitness trainer. We're working in all of these areas that we can. That's when we start to get all these marginal gains and accumulate them. And, and that's where significant improvements come from. If we just do it in one area and we look for a significant gain, we're often disappointed. But if we we collect them from multiple different points and, you know, we're just over here trying to play our part with the clubs, but we know the role of of every other team member in that uh, for the benefit of the player. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go back to our little example here. So we got our guy that's like at 90 miles an hour, 92, you know, went up to like 98 to 100. This is a really common one that we see. I'd say it's probably one of the most common uh that we'll get a question about so you know he was probably like probably playing like a regular flex shaft maybe you know something you know with a pretty you know i i would say mid profile definitely not something that was made for an extremely aggressive swinger you know let's say that player had that fit before and they were right in that like 2600 rpm backspin range things like that let's say they get this speed Let's say with that club, dynamic loft goes up, you know, I would guess, and we've seen it a lot there. Everyone's going to be different, right? But uh, we've seen a lot where that'll go up a degree and a half, two degrees even, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, spin rate starts to jump up well over 3000 into the 32, 3300 range in in that, with that new speed, Um, you know, the player definitely feels like that, that club is definitely whippier than they felt like it was when they had it fit for them. I mean, what's going to be your most common, like most common go-tos that you would start to look at with that player? You're going to go into the sort of experimental phase of, okay, with this new version of you, what's, what is it that, that sort of triggers the right, the right sort of performance? One of the biggest misconceptions in club fitting is that the faster you get, the stiffer the shaft you need. That That doesn't often play out as we think it it, it would uh, and one of the examples I always give of, of that actually there's two but there, there's one that people are very familiar with and, and it's you know Sergio Garcia and his load pattern and the how kind of you know how much he lags it loads it and there's Cameron Champ 
both of those guys have historically now they're they're actually moving towards slightly stiffer profiles right now, but both have actually historically used very tip soft profiles. Mm -hmm. So the the reason for that for them is too much lag, too much load is is not good. They actually need the the head to kick a little bit. They need that mm -hmm. deflection to happen a little bit more so that they can sort of not be as narrow in the downswing and, and not sort of be stuck with his low loft. And we see how low Cameron Champ uh, launches it at times. I mean, it's incredible how low he can uh, flight that ball, but he has mm -hmm. such, such incredible speed. Um, so the load profile of the player is truly unique. And just because your speed is up doesn't mean all of a sudden, you know, some of the popular shafts right now, Ventus, right? Ventus black, Ventus blue. Doesn't mean that you were a Ventus red at 92 miles an hour. Now you're a Ventus blue or black because you're 98 miles an hour. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, I, I always tell people, don't think that you're going to get the height change from the shaft. The, the shaft is a timing device. If you want to bring the flight down, let's let's give you a, from a 10.5 down to 9. The loft will do it for you, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to have this, the most efficient shaft that you can time, you know, as often as we possibly can. And then we'll look to the static loft, we'll look to the center of gravity, we'll look to match that that face-to-path relationship and get everything in, in sort of 3D alignment. And then we'll start to get the, the extra energy and, and the right launch and spin out of it from there. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I mean, I, I think too many people just think, oh, I'm swinging faster, I need a stiffer shaft. And I mean, I can tell you, we've coached some of the fastest players that have ever swung a golf club. And, you know, some of our players, yeah, they were playing double, triple X type shafts. There were others that were in a maybe X flex shaft that had a really soft high torque tip because they needed that to be able to time it up to get their maximum speed out of it. And you see that a lot with some of the long drive professionals out there. Yeah. It, yeah. There's so much detail to that, that I think, I, <laughs> I think that's why we need club fitting professionals. Like it's so much, it's so important to have somebody that really understands all of the physics that go into it in order to help you get something that's really going to get you more performance out of those various clubs that you're doing. Yeah. I mean, right behind me on this wall, we have over in this studio we have over 400 shafts uh on on the demo matrix behind us and it's just you know there there's so many variables now you know you talked about sort of torque we we have obviously the bend profile we have uh, the balance point so you know we might be in a ping head that's uh, you know seven eight grams heavier than a callaway head well we might need to offset that with a higher balance point club. Then we need to decide what length are we going to play at. We need to decide where the center of gravity is. I mean, just it's a constant, it's a Rubik's Cube that's constantly moving. And you're always trying to make sure that the, the squares are in perfect alignment with one another as, as these variables move. But it's, and, and the thing is, it's, in, it's, it's always in three dimensions. I just, I never like it when our guys are standing, especially, you know, just down the line. I just think if you're seeing things in two dimensions, you're 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 missing you you're missing out. You know, if you're just standing down the line, I think you've got to be in front of the player. You've got to be behind the player. You've got to be always checking dynamically how the player is reacting to the stuff you give them. The little subtleties of body language when you hand them certain clubs, I want to know immediately those first two shots. How do you react it? Third, mm -hmm. fourth, and fifth shots, you're probably figuring it out at that point. By that point your opportunity on the golf course is gone. You know, shot one and two. I, I want you to have it in shot one and two. I don't want you to try and figure it out after that. Yeah, I think that's something I've noticed with like the best fitters that I've I've been around is like the best club fitters that I know do not have people hitting 300 golf balls in a fitting. Like no. they get the data that they need very quickly um, yep. when they are making changes and make better, make better adjustments. So Going back to, to our friend here that we're just kind of talking about is just kind of average player that's gained some speed. What are some of the other things that are going to be coming into big, big play as we get away from the driver, as we get, as we go into, you know, maybe into the fairway woods, hybrids, irons, you know, let's, let's go through the bag a little bit. What are some of the other things that you'd expect to see? Well, I think as we talk about the iron iron set and, and the blending of the iron set to the woods and how that transitions, we're 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 concerned about gapping. 
uh, we're, we're worried about how we're able to create, you know, the right incremental gaps between the clubs. We we may have been moved out of a, a lighter set of of golf clubs where sort of the the game improvement heads and that type of thing, and we may have gained a, an, an awful lot of height through this additional velocity that we uh, we now have. So we have to take into consideration that. One of the keys that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more a little bit later is how does the golf ball play out in this uh, in this scenario with all of these different you know changes that we're making. Uh, the golf ball is is probably the most underutilized piece of equipment in the game itself, and it's probably the easiest one to get right. Um, so I just think people are have to consider what is our new normal. As we have these, see, we we went from ninety two miles an hour, right? So if we roughly do the the two point seven yards per mile an hour of club head speed, so we are roughly what are we at there twenty twenty yards, give or take, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so twenty yards of that two fifty ish at maximum at ninety two um, miles an hour, two forty. We are looking at that point going from that to 98 to 100 miles an hour. The new normal is up at 270. So that stretches the whole bag out. And then the three wood needs to go further. The hybrid or five wood needs to go further. The irons need to sort of make that the right gaps as well. So it's not it's, gaining speed doesn't come alone. It doesn't automatically mean that the clubs you had, the 13 clubs we hit long shots with or full shots with, they're not they're not necessarily still going to work for you. You have to have that a gap in session at least to know what the new normal looks like. I mean, I think it's even potentially good for somebody to check their own gapping. I mean, use something like our little PRGR that we we sell and at least kind of get a, you know, hit five or six shots with each one of your clubs and just see what the averages are. You know, I think you can find some of those. And then, you know, I think getting fit and having that done professionally to be able to optimize it is is really the way to go. You know, I think interesting tangent story for this year for me, I have, so I have the exact same loft setup in my irons this year as I did in high school. Mm. And every single club is one number different. Like I've always been a, I've always played four wedges. I've always liked having like, you know, 60 I've, I've always been kind of like a 60 55 56 you know 50 51 somewhere in there and then like a 46 degree pitching wedge and uh this year for the first time the actual pitching wedge in my set is like 43 degrees and you know i've got a 47 degree wedge it's, a, it's like the exact same thing and now it looks like i've got five wedges how has that just changed for people that may not have gotten fit for clubs even in the last 10, 12 years? You know, it can be kind of a wild situation, right? It, it really can. And, and also, I think it's a source of significant confusion for golfers that these stronger lofts. And I think a lot of golfers think that they're being cheated in terms of, you know, it's just it's just it's a case of just strength and loft. But center gravity manipulation has gotten so good companies have gotten so good at influencing how you know we, we've we talked a lot for a while about how the, the 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 club sort of rebounds especially from the bottom up but now companies are with the irons are getting really good at creating you know top line flex so you know when it gets that dive board effect from the getting the top rail to relax to create more launch and obviously with the increased ball speeds keeping the spin rates down a little bit that's instant distance for somebody who's losing a little bit of distance maybe later in their, their golf and life. So the, the, the stronger lofts are uh, uh, an essential thing in, in actual fact with golf now that equipment has gotten so much faster. Equipment 15, 18, 20 years ago, the ball speeds off the faces just were not... The, 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 the iron was designed with a very solid construction. Effectively, if you look at the, the sort of player's distance through to the game improvement category, the iron is now designed like a wood. You mm-hmm. know, from a COR perspective or, you know, a CT perspective, we are now seeing, I mean, irons, you can literally max out 
the efficiency of those golf clubs when you start getting into five and six and four irons and things like that. They're incredibly hot because they have wood DNA in them. So mm -hmm. in order to control the additional velocity or the, the extra velocity, we have to strengthen the lofts a little bit in order to sort of manage peak heights. It's, it's no good having all this additional velocity and your ball's just going up. It has to still fly through the correct window. And, and the stronger loft is there now to facilitate the correct window. I think for a lot of amateurs that don't get fit properly with a lot of those clubs too, those super hot irons sometimes end up with lower spin <laughs> on them. And people end up saying, well, they, you know, walk out of their fitting and say, well, I'm hitting my six iron 15 yards further, but then they mm -hmm. get on the golf course and they can't stop it. Well, one, one of the things on that, Mike, is, is, is actually spin angle of the set is far more impactful than spin on stopping a golf ball. And, you know, when we get into sort of, you know, wedge fitting and, and when we're working with players and they tell me they want to stop it faster, I'm not trying to give them more spin. I'm actually trying to create different launch conditions, angle of descent conditions to, to get it to spin. If I create more spin with wedges, let's just talk about them for a second, I'm actually going to pull the ball down. More friction will pull the ball down mm -hmm. when it comes yeah, to wedges. Slower. Yeah, it, it will. It will. It will exit the the ball will exit lower to or closer to the dynamic loft of the golf club, and you will actually you'll actually get it exiting much much lower, especially with a, a low strike point in the head. So, you know, it's these. You have to only be careful of spin when it comes to distance control. That's where spin gets dicey, because when you create lots of ball speed and miss hits are protecting the ball speed, but spin can fluctuate 2,000, then six iron can go 170 or it can go 140. That's what we want to really avoid. Um, you know, I, I'm always going to use peak height for someone to, to create a, the right angle of descent to stop the ball. And then obviously, again, back to our golf ball conversation, I'm going to pair them up with the right golf ball that matches everything else we're doing within their game. But, you know, I, I don't... I see people chasing spin to stop the ball when it's actually angle of descent that stops the ball. Yeah, get it higher. Let's Absolutely. talk about the golf ball then. I think, I mean, my opinion, it's all, it's the most important piece of equipment that people play. And I think it's probably one that a lot of people change all the time because they just don't even really realize the differences in the different golf balls they may be putting into play out on the golf course. Yeah. I always recommend our players. I mean, high level players, it's not an issue, but amateur players, we always made sure that if nothing else, they were playing the same ball all the time. That was step mm -hmm. one. And then, you know, I'd love to hear your opinion on, on how you pick the right golf ball for the player. Well, it, it, it starts from the green and works back to the tee, right? We're playing most of the shots with the putter and the wedges. That's, that's the game of golf is, has played so much from 60, 70 yards and in, in, in uh, as kind of mid and higher handicappers, generally speaking. So we do, we want to really focus on choosing the golf ball there. And then as we move back, we, we want to make sure again that we have the right balance of launch, spin, speed. And, and golf, golf, golf balls are getting very, very fast now. They, they really are, which is obviously why they're, they're trying to roll it back um, in, in the coming years. But you know, it, it has changed quite a bit. But within our selection here, I'm likely to pick a different golf ball probably three or four times in an iron fit because I'm trying to dial in just the subtleties of the launch and spin. My window of, of from the, the low spinning golf ball I have to the high spinning golf ball I have is about, if it's the golfer we're talking about at that speed, it's probably about a 1200 RPM window during an iron fit. I mean, it's massive. It's, it's certainly way more. Than, it's a lot. It's way more than I can give them with a loft and lie change. That's for sure. People come in all the time and ask me, what shaft can I use? I need a little bit more spin. Go change your golf ball. <laughs> your shaft's probably just fine. We can get you, you know, there, there's a, a changeable uh, sort of, you know, element to this that you can do with, without having to pull your club apart. So it, it plays a massive, massive part. Ian, yeah, I, I, I love the way you uh, said that. Go ahead, Tyler. 
just jump in mainly because it's maybe the end of the year and, and I need to maybe buy something new for my lab at the university. But <laughs> if, if you look at different launch monitors and all the different radars that are out there, you know, I love this discussion of, of golf balls. We've talked about golf club impact physics. Mm. Is there a radar that you like for the club, for the ball? Like, do you use them interchangeably? Is there one that you like better uh, in your fittings? How does that fit into this? We are predominantly indoor, Tyler, as sort of you are. Um, and so I, I, I got my first track, man, in 2006. Uh, I'll never forget it. We were at the we we're at Glen Eagles in Scotland. And uh, off the tour, the TaylorMade tour truck rolls this little silver case. And it looks like a little travel case. And I'm like, you know, what's this? And they, they pull out the orange box. And it was it looked like an old TV at that point. It was huge. Dude, that and, thing was um, great, though. It's still one of the best for picking up like super fast without a doubt. speed. They they had a really hard time uh, replicating. That's when they went dual radar in in four because the the three wasn't quite on the right angle to get to uh, to get the the launch conditions of it. So, um, you know that initial track man that changed my world. I'll be honest. In two thousand six, when when we first started, that we could we could quantify the differences between club A and cl- club B. And, and sort of explain it and make it really easy for the customer to to buy into what the value of this club fitting process is. That changed it all. And I will say, as a predominantly indoor club fitting company, my world equally changed in 2016 when I went to GC Quad because I was able to then talk to the, the, the client about the impact of strike location. I always had to defend radar technology a little bit because they would see a toe, they would see the ball go out to the right and they would hit it in the toe. We'd have Dr. Shaw's in the face and we'd try to be show them where they hit it and the ball would be going out to the right and they'd be going, yeah, that doesn't happen in the golf course. Well, don't worry about it. Let's hit a few more. Now I don't have to worry about that because GC Quad does such a phenomenal job at, at, at calculating the spin axis tilt that, that comes from the gear effect. So, um, Indoor, I'm very, very pro GC quad. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Outdoor, I think TrackMan is is really hard to beat. It's, it's a phenomenal unit outdoor when you're actually tracking it in, in those conditions. I'm going to send a quick email to my department chair, see if we'll just add a GC quad to the, the lab. <laughs> Tyler, you are in a blessed situation, we know. <laughs> he likes to brag about his equipment. He's getting a he's getting one of the full well putt greens in his studio too now. So your lab is is quickly becoming the place to be in uh in the the sort of R and D world, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fun six months once we get that. They're out. in the coaching world too, just so you know. All right, I want to get to some questions here. Um, I, there's one more topic I want to hit real quick before we hop into just uh, answering some of the questions we've gotten from uh, the audience so far. And that really has to do with grip size. You know, we've mm-hmm. done a lot of research on grip strength, grip pressure. You know, we certainly see a lot of players who, if we make that grip dynamometer slightly wider, we'll, we'll see significantly more capacity for that player to use the muscles in their hands and wrists and forearms, you know, to apply pressure to the grip. You know, what have you seen and what do you tell people and recommend when it comes to the size of grips that they're going to play? I mean, the, the grip is is one of, again, another one of these significantly uh, underestimated pieces of the puzzle. People just think, well, it's just a grip. Just give me any grip. And I go, no, we don't, we don't do that in here. You know, we don't do that. We, you know, we're going to go back and we're going to run through the, the full sort of list of grips. In actual fact, we, you know, we use an air compressor during the fit. And if, if we're starting to see some things with the player, I mean, obviously you're sizing them up and, and you'll have a look at their clubs, you'll have a look at hand size, and you'll have a look at, at where their hands are positioned on the club so that you know roughly what, what they're going to be doing with the, the hands through the club. But the grip is such a massive, mar- massive part of it. So from a, a, a you know a grip roll or, or sort of release standpoint, I, it's one of my marginal gains. It's one of the things that I can use um, to create the right amount of grip pressure. Because the last thing I want is someone with large hands trying to hold on to a grip that's too small. Therefore, they squeeze to try and get the contact on, on that grip. And I also don't want someone with smaller hands trying to 
you know, create you know enough pressure into that golf club to control the club face. So it is an absolute huge part, not to mention the impact it has on the build of the golf club itself. You know, we've got grips in here that you keep the same grip size, you keep the same grip model, you just change the color of the grip and the weight goes up by six grams, which mm -hmm. changes the, the the center of gravity of that golf club or the swing weight of that golf club. It moves higher up the shaft. So, you know, players then start to talk about, I can't really feel the head as much anymore. It's a massive, massive part of the equation. And, you know, I, I, it's never something that, that we sort of overlook in our process, a big, big part of it. Yeah, and, and I'll be honest, like, we never found that there was a 100% correlation to, like, hey, if you've got big hands, you're going to need a jumbo grip. And if you have, nope. you know, I can't tell you how many how many female players that we would fit into standard or mid-size grips just mm -hmm. because they were able to create a little bit more grip pressure with that easier. It just was easier for them to do. And it didn't have a lot of negative effects on their ability to control the club. So anyway, that's another one that I, I think is one of those topics that's out there that people aren't talking about as much as they should be for sure. Definitely. Definitely. I was an eye opener when I came to the lab and, and done the grip strain test. And, um, you know, it, I always, I always said, I was really thought that I had quite a, you know, I had fairly small wrists and you know, I played some racket sports, but I didn't realize that I had, you know, quite a high, you know, grip strength. And that was one of the huge takeaways for me. So I've actually completely changed the grips that I use in my club after being in the lab. And, and also the amount of reps I've been putting in over the winter time. I used to use a multi-compound grip, which is really heavily textured, very popular grip. People love it, but the amount of golf balls I hit nowadays, it, it would just tear my hands to pieces. So I've went to a different size, a different texture, a different uh, taper rate. It, it's, uh, you know, just always looking for those little gains. Yeah, definitely something to take a look at. Okay, well, it looks like we got some pretty good questions in here, Kyle. You want to throw a couple out at us? Hey, Tyler, do you want to read them out? Yeah, that sounds great. I, I kind of walked through, guide us through them. So, um yeah. This one's from Michael Clark. Uh, he's starting another training session uh, with speed training. Uh, how long should a person wait to club fit when changing your speed that you swing at? Is a month long enough or should be a concern when getting fitted correctly? And, and I, I think, Michael, we kind of touched on this a little bit. We'll just kind of add in the idea, of, I think, for sure, the, the maintenance, right? Getting to a time where you don't expect to get fit and then four weeks later you just gain five to six miles per hour of swing speed. I don't know, Ian, if there's anything you want to add to that. No, the word, no, he, the word he said was stability, right? When you feel like the changes that you've made become stable, mm -hmm. that's yep. that's the right time. Mm -hmm. That is 100%. It. When, when you know that you're not really pushing for more, you, 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 you know, you may exit out of the 90 a you know mile an hour category and you're pushing for 105 well that that's a different that's a different zone at, at that point so when you're sort of content to play at that level for a while that's a good time awesome um another question from a michael witt he wondered uh, do club fitters have financial incentives to recommend one manufacturer over another N never my, my club fitters don't even know what the clubs cost to, 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 for us to buy they have no idea. Um, so there, there's there's no there's no incentive. Um, you know, I listen, it, it this is in full transparency, and I think it's important to say that at the big box level, of course, of course there is, right? There's you know, they're 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 not there's there's club fitters and their sales associates or, or salespeople within these stores. There's no, there's no getting away from it. There's gonna be some relationships, some incentive programs. Maybe there's a month where Cobra donates a driver to the, you know, the sales associate that sells the most Cobra. Well, that's life, you know. We're we're not we're not going to be um sort of you know blind enough to to what goes on in that world. But in the fitting world, you're the most important person in our company at that time in the bay. We call ourselves brand agnostic because we only care about you. We the the, the clubs and the drawers are tools, the shafts and the wall are tools. And, and all we're doing is we have tools to fix your problems. It, it's a, irrelevant what brand it is. Awesome. That's actually kind of a good follow-up to a, a question and comment from um, uh, Tim, who said, first off, uh, Ian, your online videos are some of the best, if not the best I've seen, which you know, we agree as well. Um, you, uh, 
question is uh, when fitting, uh, how about the player being married to a brand or coming to mm. see this brand agnostic? How important is that for the player? Yeah, it, it's uh, it is definitely a, a tricky one. And at the end of the day, we just, we hope that we can deliver the results in a way in which they can see that they're, if they want to stick with the brand that they're loyal to, unless they're writing a check for you, why would you not take the results that are on the table? Um, I mean, you know, unless you're incentivized to play those clubs, you know, just because your favorite golfer plays, you know, a said brand, you should always be looking at just what is absolutely best for you. So the, the good thing is nowadays, everyone is pretty much making good equipment nowadays. There's, there's, there's not really, uh, again, bad, bad equipment. It's just, if you go to one OEM to be fit and go to their fitting sort of location, you might have three or four heads to try. Maybe that might be a good scenario. If you come here, you're probably going to have 30, 40, 50 heads to try. I like your chances of finding the right one within that selection. Yeah. Uh, play yeah. devil's advocate slightly. I mean, the big brands are making many more options for everybody. You know, I would say so yeah. there's, there's definitely a bigger range. Like, you know, I mean, if you're going to look at the entire line of Titleist irons or the line of Mizuno irons or TaylorMade, like there's certainly more options than there used to be in each one of those brands. But yeah, I would just be in that same boat. Like why limit yourself? I mean, yeah, I'm going to play whatever club gets me the best performance in my bag. And I really have no other allegiance. I, I think a lot of people should adopt that mentality. Um. Ian, they're, they're, I'm going to group a couple of these questions together. A couple of questions mm -hmm. related to kind of shafts. And so I'm going to kind of just group a few together. Um, one is kind of this idea of shaft profile, uh, maybe uh, shaft weight compared to the flex rating, and any thoughts you have on counterweighting. So maybe kind of mm -hmm. all lump together to maybe some more details on the shaft. Yeah. Uh, so bend profile in the shaft is, is something that as we – is, is us, our fitters, day, doing this day in, day out, this is really our job, our, it's our role to know the the differences in bend profile between a dynamic gold and a Project X, right? Knowing that a softer handle and a dynamic gold might be better for a player who's a little bit of a smooth loader and maybe has a little bit more hit at the bottom versus somebody that's a bit more aggressive in transition. So for when we're working with our players and we're analysing that, okay, Two players might to get might get to the same speed, but how they get there, the journey is very different. So, you know, again, a, a sort of I guess an R and D term when when you're kind of measuring the way shafts deflect is when your deflector are fending that shaft. You can do it early or you can do it late. So we're we're maybe picking a bend profile that matches the load profile of that golfer. That that's a big part of what that uh, bend profile does. Um, with regards to uh, flex versus weight, one of my favorite discussion points, it really is, I, I, far, I, I, I lean much more towards weight than I do towards flex and importance. I, I don't think it's actually that important. I don't think it's that straightforward that because you are X speed, you are this flex and shaft. I, I think there's much more... Uh, to be gained from finding the right weight of uh, of golf shaft than, than even the right flex of golf shaft. So I think it's, you know, making sure, again, you've got options at your disposal for that. Um, counterbalance is, is an interesting one. A few years ago, I mean, the, the big claim was that, you know, put those tour locks in the butt end of your golf club and shrink the dispersion circle in the club. And I used to just kind of shake my head at that. And it just... It, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, now, it could for some. Again, if we want to use Sergio for as an example, Sergio always used counterbalance golf clubs. Jack Nicholas used counterbalance golf clubs. One of the things with those two guys is they were always trying to get their angles out of their golf swing on the way down. So they're trying, they, they like when the, the, the head side of the, the golf club feels lighter and they can actually create a little bit more width. And then you've got golfers who maybe are a little bit casty. I'm looking for a little bit more head weight for them. I want them to have the awareness within their golf swing that they know where that head is and they can sort of delay the, the sort of, you know, the unloading of that shaft, the hit on the way down. So 
I think balance point is another lever that a, a club fitter can use to their advantage. Awesome. Those are great. Uh, uh, nice question by Peter here. He's wondering if, if speed can affect the composition of the back. So meaning as they gain speed, they maybe start swinging the driver 120. Is that a time that's kind of maybe Mike was discussing, or are they going to tend to get more wedges in their bag, less things on the high end? You know, how does speed maybe shift just the composition of the bag? Yeah, it, it will do. It, it will change. It will change a lot of things. Um, you know, you, you may have had, you know, you may have had driver four wood, seven wood, and then you do gain speed, and and all of a sudden, you know, you can't really control the the uh the peak height of the four and seven wood. You might be creating too much spin, and you need to go back to three and five wood and things like that. So, yeah, the the the, the composition really does change as you gain uh, as you gain speed. Um, you're creating that extra velocity doesn't come alone. Yeah, I think the big deal that you got to look at there too is that as you gain speed, it's going to spread all of those different gappings out in your bag. So, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, I hit my seven iron 155 yards. Mm -hmm. But when we really look at that, like the difference if you took, did the statistics on somebody's seven iron, right? Somebody that thinks they hit their seven iron 155 yards may over two standard deviations away from the you know median hit it anywhere from 145 yards to you know 162 yards and it's more of this window or range of how far they hit that golf club what we see a lot is as people gain speed that range increases so you're longest pure shot you're going to hit is going to go a little further and you're still going to have some of those miss hits potentially so Sometimes that can be an effect. Do you see that as well, Ian? Yeah, without a doubt. Like with that, uh, without a doubt, we we definitely see that range increase a little bit. And and when the range increases, you know, you look at someone like Bryson when he went through his speed gains. It, it wasn't. It's not straightforward. You know, when those when those gaps between your seven and your six go to 16, 17 yards. You know, it might be a little bit easier to to pick clubs when it's ten yards because one thing golfers typically struggle with is is kind of partial shots. So when you're constantly stuck between yardages all day, people don't feel that comfortable. Maybe they don't they don't get an opportunity to practice as much as they want. So, you know, if you've got a high level of speed, now that's an extreme case. But if you do have a high level of speed, those gaps do get wider, and you have to play those those little partial shots a lot more. Uh. Ian, and I, I think maybe you mentioned a little bit about your process here, but somebody had a question just about how would they go about choosing the right golf ball? You had mentioned mm -hmm. kind of the idea of starting with some things around the green and short distances and then moving back. Um, again, if, if they're trying to find the right golf ball for some for themselves, any any suggestions? Well, if, if I can if I can say one thing just to start that one, Tyler, is if you can afford to do so everyone should be playing a premium golf ball. There, there is no, no two-piece golf ball, you know, with a Serling cover or, or some, some cheaper cover that will help your golf game. It, 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 we've seen the tests. We've, we've seen it. And actually, the higher the handicapper, the more they benefit from the premium golf ball. Title has done an incredible test uh, around the cradle, and uh, they gave they gave golf golfers a two piece golf ball, and they gave them a Pro V one of their choice. And the I think the the higher handicappers were four shots better with the Pro V one premium golf ball than they were with the two piece golf ball. The lower the handicap, the more the player is skilled with their ability to adapt. How is the ball going to run out? Maybe the, there's not as much friction, so we might get higher launch and you know some slightly different conditions. That is part of being a lower handicapper and part of being a higher handicapper, the ability to adapt. So by, by you know, if you possibly can, even if it's last year's golf ball, but get a urethane cover that's, you know, quality and, and well-made and, and you can sort of trust. There's lots of good resources out there now to, to sort of ball Namic is a phenomenal re resource and things like that. Use a premium golf ball. Do not use... I sort of I reuse lake ball or anything like that. They're horrendous for performance. So um, that's that's the first thing, and it will impact your scores. And when it comes to choosing it, feel is actually a huge part of it. 
how you like the the the, the ball to uh, feel on the club face will directly impact sort of your your sort of performance as well. So you know. We will look at the numbers. We will find the right spin window. We will look at compression and how compression influences launch. You know, typically higher compressions launch a little bit higher. Uh, lower lower compressions will kind of come out a little bit lower. So we we work it back from the green. We don't put in here with the golf ball choice. We we won't we won't go to that level. But we will hit little chip shots into full wedge shots into irons woods, and then lastly we'll use the driver. And, and on tour, we actually used to fit the driver to the ball, not the ball to the driver. So we would fit the ball to the wedges, to the irons, and then the woods would actually be fit to the ball, not the other way around. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Our our first step in our club fitting process was actually having players hit putts with, a di with different golf balls to see mm -hmm. which ones they like the sound of coming off their putter, and then wedges, and then going from there. Because – it, I always found it was a lot easier to be able to optimize everything around the ball that player liked to play, yeah. you know, than necessarily already having the equipment chosen and then trying to find the right ball that 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 fit all the different windows. Okay, we just got a couple more. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Actually, someone asked a question about warming up, stretching before and after speed training sessions. What can be done to minimize the chance for injury? And I'll just answer real quickly. The warm up is key. We find that when individuals uh, do the warm up, they 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 have much less reported injuries. That's from a, a data collection I did in the past. I think as club fitting is concerned, for sure, make sure that as you go, you give proper time to get that body moving. Right? You don't want to just hop out of your car, step into Ian's Bay, and uh, <laughs> take, take two swings and say, "Hey, I'm ready to go. Let's get after it." So I think obviously let's let's learn how to get our bodies prepped. Uh, for for the the task of either speed training or being fit, and I think that's you know a warm up that probably lasts longer than uh, four or five swings. Um, With without a doubt, yeah. <laughs> I uh, the the one that this is kind of an interesting question. Um, uh, someone asked the idea of uh, after they finish going through speed training, is it more likely that they need to get fit for drivers and woods, or more likely that they would need to get refit for irons? Um, or would it be equal for both of them? Yeah, it would be. It would be equal for 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 both. You know, depending on their start point, what they started with equipment wise, it, it could it could you know skew the the decision as to which we uh, we change first. Um, but it, it could. You guys see all the time. Um, no two people will will sort of come out of a speed training session the same. You know that people will find new kind of new ways to move, new movement patterns. Uh, like you said earlier, Mike, you know, some people might find that they're retaining some lag, you know, some more lag in the downswing and, you know, they're, they're getting a different sort of level of compression. That that That's going to influence a driver very differently than it will an iron. So uh, mm -hmm. it just depends how they come through that session. But just just getting with a, a club fitter to create a new baseline is is important and then go from there. Awesome. We've uh, even we've we've talked a lot about the idea of gaining speed. There were a couple of questions actually about losing some speed, and and while that's not something we want to think too much about, <laughs> uh, understanding that if a golfer comes into you and and maybe they're having a, a couple of extra birthdays, and and they maybe anticipate losing some speed in the future, or potentially maybe that golfer that after their um, primary training phase, um, they end up stopping their speed training altogether and they maybe were 110 and six months later they look up they haven't done anything and they're back down to 102 uh what what comes into mind when you're thinking about them maybe losing some of the speed that they've gained it's uh it's, it's a real that's, that's a really good question and probably will help a, a lot of people as they they sort of create these new sort of um you know upper speeds that they see and then maybe they, yeah, maybe they do creep back down a little bit. And I always say to people, don't, don't fall in love with the the high, the highest speed that you see from yourself. I think that the peak of the peak of when I first started speed training, I was a hundred miles an hour. When I got to my the fastest I ever got, I got to one twenty four. Uh, right now, I'm living at about one fourteen, one fifteen. So I, that's a wide range. It's a really, really wide range. So. I don't think of myself as the guy at 124 and I don't think of myself as the guy at, at sort of a hundred. I, I just think you've got to try and see again, where's the baseline? 
you said it earlier, Mike, about PRGR and, and uh, PRGR Black and getting out on the course and taking that. And so what's your golf course speed? What is the one-off, what the one-shot speed? I, I, I'm not, again, in love with fall. I'm not in love with what's your speed after 15 or 20 swings. Mm. I want to know what you are in the golf swing on the sixth tee when you've got one go at it. Are we a little bit less? We probably are. Right, we probably are a little bit less than we might be in the bay, warm, and you know we're we're going, and the motion feels good. We'll get a little feel for hitting that lead side and really pushing out it, and how we create that speed. We don't always have that every single swing in the golf course, so I think it's important to do a little bit of that uh, training as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think actually getting out on the golf course with that little unit's a really fun thing to do. I think. More people will be surprised of the numbers they see out there than you think. I've had people mm. to get on the golf course and are always two, three miles an hour faster than they are in practice. I've had others that are two or three miles an hour slower. Like it's very different depending on the player and their mentality and, you know, just the way they swing on the golf course. It's obviously our goal is to try to make it as, the, as similar as we can in practice. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of our super speed protocols help people with. But ah, uh, yeah, test it. It is a it is a wild deal when you start looking at speed on the golf course. Uh, Ian, just uh, two questions. Uh, I think kind of last ones related to irons. One question on using kind of a shaft optimizer to begin a fitting, like a Mizuno mm. shaft optimizer, and then so I had a question about some of, of what we're seeing in some of these uh, graphite uh, iron shafts compared to steel iron shafts, something like the KDS TGI or steel fiber uh, compared to some of the steel iron shafts. I think the Mizuno uh, shaft optimizer is actually a phenomenal tool. Uh, I think, you know, if if I was a head pro at, at a club and I was thinking about the mix of hard goods I was going to be bringing in and, and I was, you know, I believe in fitting and fitting is part of, you know, what we're built within our staff. We've got fitters that we're going to really invest in them and they're going to invest the time to learn it. Mizuno would be my first choice to bring them in because I think that optimizer is such a useful tool. I don't think at a club, the club fitter is probably ever really going to get the reps to say ever, but initially they're not going to get the reps to understand load and you know tempo and all these things that that the optimizer will give you uh, a sort of number for. They'll, they'll give you a sort of designation for how that player loads the golf club. So I think that's an amazing tool. I really do, and I think every club that's invested in club fitting should should look at that. Um, and regards to graphite shafts, I, I keep saying the same line. If if people or if if shaft companies making graphite shafts, if they would just make them the same price as steel, steel has a problem. They really do. If it was the same price, the problem is right now it's it's kind of 40, 50, 60 percent more. You know, we're seeing Axiom, we're seeing you know Mitsubishi MMTs. The, the capability or the ability for the shaft designer to do whatever they want with that shaft lives in a graphite shaft. Steel mm. is a pretty miserable material when it comes to our ability to create change. Um, we done a test yesterday. I had three different shafts between a dynamic gold for me personally, dynamic gold and a Project X. I think there was less than 0.2 of a, of a degree of launch difference and less than 50 RPMs of spin difference. And these are supposed to be opposite ends of the scale. One's supposed to fly, you know, a little higher, dynamic gold. One's supposed to fly really flat in uh, in Project X. And it, it, just, it just didn't do that. So, you know, the ability to change bend profile, balance point, all of these different things, taper rate, it, it just the future of or or the opportunity with future design lives in graphite. Awesome, Ian. Uh, this is probably a great question to end on, which is you know we probably have a lot of people who've gained some speed or who listen to this and say, hey, we want to get fit. What what suggestions when they're going about trying to find a, a, a competent and good club fitter in their area? I mean, one of the things with with us joining the club champion family, Tyler was the ability to create a network and not just in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, in the US. I think across the company now, there's about 150 stores, maybe a little over 150 stores. 
that's create a network, an inter sort of connected network. So we obviously have the YouTube cho- the YouTube channel where we we have obviously the information where we share and things like that. But what then you've got to do something with that information. You've got to connect with that fitter like we talked about at the start. Get that trust and and really start to work on uh, building out your set for for you. So. You know, within the club champion family, we have tons of options. I mean, you know, especially in the US, there's there's not many, you know, streets you turn down that, that you don't see one nowadays. Um, up in Canada, we're trying, we're we're getting there. We're we're trying to get to the major cities before we get to that. So, but align yourself with that a competent um, club fitter that will stand you in really good stead. Make them part of your team. Connect your coach and your club fitter, like we said at the start. And and I think the player is the one that's going to reap the rewards of that. Awesome. Okay. That, I think that's all of them. Uh, Ian and Mike, we uh, yeah covered a lot of great topics in those questions. Thanks for all those wonderful questions from the listeners. Yeah. I appreciate yeah, that, Tyler. And Ian, uh, really, really appreciate you spending some time with us this afternoon. Uh, for everybody that listened in, we hope you found some information that's going to help you with your golf game. Um, we'll see you next time. Our next super speed webinar probably coming up in the next few weeks to a month. So stay tuned on all of our channels. Also check out all of Ian's channels. They're fantastic. And until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.